Hi, this is Michael Autos. We're continuing our discussion of circulation, and this is recording part three. Let's take a moment to focus in on hypo and hypernatremia. For example, suppose you had a patient who is dehydrated and had hyperosmolar extracellular fluid. Right, a patient who is dehydrated and hypernatremic. It would seem that patient really only needs free water and not electrolytes. So could we give the patient pure water IV? Well, pure water has no tonicity, and all of that free water will rapidly enter red blood cells and cause them to swell when it makes contact. So usually we give the patient 5% dextrose, D5, which is nearly isoosmotic at first, so infusing it will not cause swelling of the red blood cells. Then the dextrose is rapidly absorbed and metabolized, and the remaining free water will help correct the increase in extracellular fluid osmolarity associated with the dehydration. An alternative would be that you could give the patient 0.45% sodium chloride, or half normal saline. That would be giving the patient some normal saline together with some free water. <clears throat> this all makes sense in a theoretical way, but most patients who have an abnormal volume status also have an electrolyte imbalance. We could measure a patient's serum osmolarity, although we often don't, but since almost all of serum osmolarity is due to sodium and its associated anion, which is usually chloride, a standard chemistry panel tells us a lot of information about a patient's osmolar state. And so let's focus on the two most common causes of hyper and hypoosmolarity, which are hypo and hypernatremia. Hyponatremia is when serum sodium is less than 135 milliequivalents per liter. It can be caused when sodium losses exceed water losses, or when free water gain exceeds sodium gain. And so we see there are two subcategories of hyponatremia, hypovolemic and hypervolemic. Hypovolemic Hyponatremia is when the loss of sodium exceeds the loss of free water. This can occur if there are GI losses due to vomiting or diarrhea, third space losses, as we see in burns or pancreatitis, or renal losses, which can occur with diuretics, hypoaldosteronism, or renal disease. On the other hand, hypervolemic, or sometimes euvolemic, hyponatremia occurs when the increased total body water exceeds the increased sodium intake. We could see this in patients who have adrenal insufficiency, hypothyroidism, or SIADH. It can also occur in patients who have polydipsia and increase their free water intake orally. And we see it in patients who have cirrhosis, heart failure, or renal disease and injury. Notice that in all cases of hyponatremia, we have a case of hypoosmolarity which means our intracellular fluid volume will increase as water enters the cells and the cells will swell. This can lead to edema of brain cells, manifesting as headache, nausea, or lethargy. And if it occurs quickly enough, that is, if sodium drops below about 115 to 120 rapidly, patients can develop seizures, coma, brain damage, herniation, and even death. But this is in the acute setting. Gradual hyponatremia is much better tolerated, as the brains transport that solute to prevent significant cell swelling. The treatment of hyponatremia will involve either replacement of sodium or removal of free water, and it's going to depend on the underlying cause. Patients who have hypovolemic hyponatremia usually need resuscitation with sodium chloride, and in severe cases, 3% sodium chloride. On the other hand, hypervolemic hyponatremia is treated with fluid restriction and diuretics in order to, relieve, re, in order to remove free water, and ADH or vasopressin antagonists may also be needed. Ultimately, you want to treat the underlying cause. But keep in mind that rapid correction of hyponatremia can also be dangerous as it can lead to osmotic injury from osmotic demyelination, that is, loss of the myelin sheath around the nerves. In general, we correct hyponatremia at a rate of about 
um, less than 10 to 12 milli equivalents per liter in 24 hours. That would come out to about half a milli equivalent per liter per hour. And any additional correction over the next 24 hours, we want to keep to less than a total correction of 18 milli equivalents per liter in 48 hours. The exception is that rapid correction would be okay for rapid onset hyponatremia. You might see this in acute free water intake, like someone who's been exercising and drank a very large amount of free water, or psychogenic polydipsia, ecstasy use, or hypotonic fluid administration. <clears throat> Along those lines, we can discuss TERP syndrome. TERP is a transurethral resection of the prostate, and this procedure, which is done through the urethra with a, uh, with a scope, uh, fluids are used to irrigate the bladder during this procedure. Even though it's called TERP syndrome, it can occur with other similar procedures. So resection of bladder tumors, um, hysteroscopic procedures can all have the same effect occur. And they occur when large volumes of irrigation with high hydrostatic pressures are used. And that uh, irrigation fluid is absorbed through the organ being infused, and it gets into the intravascular volume. And this intravascular volume expansion leads to volume overload, hypertension, reflex bradycardia, and even pulmonary edema, and certainly hyponatremia. Of course, this would happen if it's a sodium-free irrigation solution. And we've seen cases where people have had extreme hyponatremia, like 106 milliequivalents per liter, and hypoosmolarity down to, say, 235 milliosmoles. If patients are awake, let's say it was done under spinal anesthesia, we would see confusion or agitation, visual disturbances, manifestations of cerebral edema leading to cardiovascular collapse and seizures. Remember, the blood-brain barrier is permeable to water, but not to sodium, and so we see all of these effects of hyponatremia. And that's why classically spinal anesthesia was used during these types of procedures in order to monitor for changes in mental status. Nowadays, these cases are often done under a general anesthetic, and we try not to use hypoosmolar -osm solutions or hypotonic solutions, but nevertheless, we still need to be aware of rapid uptake of these solutions into the vasculature. And if hyponatremia occurs rapidly, rapid correction would be appropriate with diuretics or hypertonic saline if needed. <clears throat> There's a point I just want to bring to your attention, mostly for your reference, and that's when glucose moves into cells slowly, there's a transient increase in extracellular fluid osmolality. And this causes movement of water from the intracellular fluid to the extracellular fluid and transient dilution of the serum sodium, which doesn't need to be treated. So what I'm saying is that when patients have very high blood sugar, the sodium that is measured is not an accurate reflection of the patient's true serum sodium. And there's an equation that can be used to calculate a corrected sodium. So for example, a patient whose sodium is 128, but their serum glucose is 550, the corrected sodium is actually 135, showing that their sodium is actually normal. And therefore, we would not treat this seemingly low sodium level. You don't have to memorize this equation, but it's good to be aware that in, ca in cases of severe hyperglycemia, your sodium levels may be inaccurate when they're measured. <clears throat> So we've discussed hyponatremia. Now we're going to discuss the opposite, which is hypernatremia, when serum sodium is greater than 145 milli equivalents per liter. This occurs when patients have loss of water or no access to free water, or if they have excess intake or administration of sodium. And so once again, we see two subcategories. We see a hypo or euvolemic hypernatremia, where patients have lost free water in excess of their sodium losses. This could occur with vomiting or diarrhea, with diuretics, renal disease, or diabetes insipidus, excess losses through the skin due to burns, sweating, or fever, or a patient who has no access to water. On the other hand, hypervolemic hypernatremia occurs when sodium intake exceeds total body water intake. This would be due to hypertonic fluid administration or hyperaldosteronism. 
The signs and symptoms of hypernatremia are once again mostly due to hyperosmolarity. Patients will exhibit thirst and cell shrinkage, especially in the brain, leading to confusion, hyperreflexia, seizures, and coma. Once again, symptoms occur especially when hypernatremia has a rapid onset, typically to area to levels of about 158 to 160 milliequivalents per liter, whereas chronic or gradual hypernatremia is much better tolerated. The treatment for hypernatremia will depend on the underlying cause. The goal is to replace the free water deficit and remove any excess sodium if necessary. Once again, it should be corrected slowly over about 24 to 48 hours with a goal of changing your osmolarity by about 0.5 per liter per hour in order to avoid brain edema. If the patient has hypovolemic hypernatremia, the goal is to replace the free water deficit, and this could be done with D5 or 0.45% sodium chloride. The free water deficit can be calculated using the equation shown here, where your free water deficit in liters is your total body water times your serum sodium divided by 140 minus 1. Hypervolemic hypernatremia may be treated by diuretics, and once again, identifying and treating the underlying cause. This chart summarizes the four types of hypo and hypernatremia, gives examples for each, and shows the commonly expected findings as far as serum sodium, extracellular fluid volume, and intracellular fluid volume. This is a chart you should be able to reproduce for an exam. That's the end of our discussion about hyper and hyponatremia. We will continue the discussion on circulation in the next recording.